If you have a Bible, Luke chapter 23 is where we will be today. When I was in ninth grade, I ran for class president and I lost the election. Um, and that was super embarrassing as a whole. But um, when that happened, my stepdad was an assistant principal at my high school. And so in sixth period, the last class of the day, uh, before they announced it over the intercom that I had lost, um, he called to dismiss me early. And I knew that was probably a bad sign, but um, I... I got checked out of class, and so I walked down to his office, and I got into his office, and he just said, I, I knew the results, and I just didn't want you to have to be in class for that. And I've always appreciated that. I've always thought that was just such a kind thing, because I know what it's like to not get dismissed from the class. And you do too, don't you? You know what it's like to be in a moment where not only did something embarrassing kind of happen to you, but then people pointed it out. You know what it's like to be mocked and made fun of, don't you? Maybe there are certain places where you're more prone to experience that than others. Maybe there are places that you grew up and you still associate that place with insecurities that you felt because of things that people said to you in that place. Maybe at work, there's a certain group of people that you feel intimidated by because you've been made fun of, you've been mocked. Maybe even just at your home. Maybe with your parents. Sometimes you just feel picked on. Or maybe you feel that way about your kids. And so it alters the way that you do things because you don't want to be mocked. You don't want to be made fun of. Maybe that's true about your ex-wife and there are these places that you can go where you don't feel like you can be yourself because of the mocking that might take place. Maybe that's even how you feel about the church. And maybe there are things about you that you're afraid would get brought up. Maybe there's something about the way that you look or there's something about your personality or there's something about your past or there's something about your status in life, how much money you make, or the kind of car you drive, or the job you have, or the education level that you have, or lack thereof. And these things can cause you to be afraid of the mocking, afraid of being made fun of. And the reason that you might have those fears is because you know what it's like to not get dismissed from the class. You know what it's like to be in an environment and be picked on, to be mocked. And one of the beautiful things about Christianity is that God knows too. God knows too what it's like to be mocked. It's kind of interesting to me that Jesus came to save sinners and one of the things that the gospel writers make sure that we don't miss is that Jesus was mocked on his way to the cross and even while he was on the cross. Why is that important? Why is it important to see the mocking? Why the mocking? What's so significant about Jesus being mocked? And when I ask that question, I'm really asking two questions. The first is, why would people that Jesus came to save mock him? And if Jesus came to die for sinners, why was it necessary for him to die on a cross, the most humiliating form of execution in the Roman world? And why couldn't he have just been sent to death in a room with some of his friends? Why did it need to be public? Why is it humiliating? Why the mocking? That's what I want to talk about today. Why is it important to see that Jesus was mocked? And the reason 
is because the mocking teaches us something about us and it teaches us something about him. And so what we're going to do is read through a couple of uh, big sections in Luke 22 and 23. And sometimes what we do is walk through a passage of scripture and get into the details. Today what we're going to do is just look at a big chunk of scripture and talk about a theme. And so we're going to do that by starting in Luke chapter 22 in verse 63. The men who were holding Jesus started mocking and beating him. After blindfolding him, they kept asking, prophesy, who was it that hit you? And they were saying many other blasphemous things to him. Skip down to 23 verse one. Then their whole assembly rose up and brought him before Pilate. They began to accuse him saying, We found this man misleading our nation, opposing payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Pilate then told the chief priests and the crowds, I find no grounds for charging this man. But they kept insisting, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee where he started even to here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. Finding that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. Herod was very glad to see Jesus. For a long time, he had wanted to see him because he had heard about him and was hoping to see some miracle performed by him. So he kept asking him questions, but Jesus did not answer him. Verse 10. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt, mocked him, dressed him in bright clothing, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Previously, they had been enemies. Skip down to verse 32. Two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So why the mocking? First, because it teaches us something about us. What does it teach us? Well, they're mocking Jesus because they resist his claims. They resist his claims. He claims to be king, and they're resisting that. And he claims to be savior, and they're resisting that. So they're resisting his claims, king and savior. And look who's doing that. 
anyone can mock. The guards are mocking. The religious leaders and scribes are mocking. Herod was mocking and then Pilate saw it and they became friends. So they both are mocking. The crowd is mocking. The soldiers are mocking. And even one of the other criminals is mocking because they resisted his claims. And we can still resist these claims today. We still resist Jesus's claim to be king. There's something in all of us that wants to resist somebody else's authority and wants to maintain control ourselves. We don't want to be in a position of weakness. We want to be in a position of strength. We don't want to be a sheep. We want to be a lion. My uh, niece, when she was, she's five now, but when she was three, um, we would, you know, be around the table and we would say, how can we pray for you? And she would get so offended. And she would say, you don't pray for me. And she would point her finger at you like this. And she'd say, I'll pray for you, but you don't pray for me. And we would say, we're, you know, well, we're going to pray for you anyway. So we'll just, no, stop that. I will pray for you. You don't pray for me. Even in her little three-year-old brain and heart, she knew that for somebody to pray for you puts you in a position of needing help from somebody else. And she resisted that. I can pray for you because, well, I'm the one who, you know, could intervene on your behalf, but you're not gonna pray for me. And there's a little of that in all of us. We do not want to, to lose control of our lives. We don't want Jesus to be king. We want to have the power. We want to be the king. We want to be the queen. We want to control our lives. And consequently, Jesus is threatening. When a kid says, it's a free country, or you can't tell me what to do, that's him exercising this thing in all of us that wants autonomy and authority. When a teenage girl insults her parents because she can't get her way. When a boy makes fun of someone around the girl he likes. When we lie to save face. When we gossip to tear down someone's reputation behind their back. When an employer takes credit for every good idea. When we compromise sexually or when we rationalize destructive behavior in our lives. These are all ways that we prove our passion for power. We want to be in control. But Jesus claims to be king, and that's threatening. And so many times we approach Jesus feeling like, how dare someone try to control my life? And other times, Some people do not resist Jesus's claim to authority. Instead, they just change what Jesus says. I was sitting with a guy one time who was explaining how he just didn't want to be married to his wife anymore. Not for any reason other than just she didn't make him happy anymore. And I said, well, you know, you're a follower of Jesus. What do you think Jesus would say about that? What do you mean? Jesus doesn't want me to be unhappy. So of course, Jesus would support my decision. See, here's a guy who doesn't, he doesn't want to resist Jesus. He just wants to change what Jesus says. And in doing so, he's resisting Jesus as king. Jesus is king. He doesn't come to ask your opinion. He comes to give orders. He's king. And if Jesus is king, that means that he gets to determine how I live my life. At the church, well, I'm the interim lead pastor. So here's what we're doing. That's not how it works. 
The church is not a place for my agenda or your agenda. The church is a place that is under the authority of Jesus. In your dating life, you don't get to say, well, on Instagram, this is what everybody says is how you do things. You don't get to say, well, the way my friends do it. You don't get to say, well, just because your parents say so doesn't make it the right thing. Ultimately, all things come down to the authority of Jesus. It's true of marriage and parenting. It's true of your time and your money. It's true of your sexuality. And it's true of your very thoughts. Think about that. In the New Testament, there are commands about what you should think about. Do you realize the audacity of that? Jesus is king so much so that he's willing to tell you what you're allowed to even think about. Even when you're just driving down the road, you're not allowed to just be on your own with your own thoughts. Instead, Jesus is trying to bud into that as well. Jesus claims to be king. And there's something in all of us that resists his claim to be king. We're threatened by that. Why? Because we have a passion for power. And so Jesus is threatening. That was true then. And it's true now. And so we mock. And Jesus doesn't just claim to be king. He also claims to be savior. And that is a claim that we resist as well. Even as Christians, we can resist this claim. And here's what I mean. Why are you tempted to hide your sin? Why are you tempted to put up a face for others to see so that they'll think of how great of a man or great of a woman you are? Why are you tempted to stay in the dark and hide rather than come into the light and be exposed? Why do you have to deny and cover up your sin rather than confess it and be honest? Why is that? Because deep down, there's something in you that believes that you need to be your savior. If you were to be exposed, that would ruin your life. You are responsible for protecting yourself, for saving yourself. And so you've got to hide. You can't be honest. You can't let people know what really goes on in your mind and your heart. You can't let people know what you did when you were on your own. You're responsible for protecting yourself. Do you see how that is a decision to resist Jesus' claim to be a savior. And then maybe you're spiritual but not religious. And you also struggle and resist this claim that Jesus is the savior. Maybe when you think about religion and the world, you think, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe. It matters what you do. Doctrines and beliefs, they just divide people. They just create division. And so drop the beliefs and just be a good person who's kind and loves people. Can't we all agree on that? And of course, that's a doctrine. (laughs) Or maybe you feel... Like all roads lead to heaven. You've got to determine what religion or what God or what spiritual practice works best for you. And if that's different than me, that's okay. We're all on the same road. All roads lead up the mountain. We've all just got a piece of the elephant. But Jesus came and claimed to be the Savior, not a Savior. And that's offensively exclusive. And so we mock. 
Jesus says there is salvation in no one else but him. That's offensive. Even as I say that in this room, it's like, oh gosh. But Jesus is the Savior. And Jesus is not just offensively exclusive. He's also offensively inclusive. And here's what I mean. Jesus says, anybody can be saved. Anybody. You're a rapist, Jesus came for you. You cheat on your taxes, Jesus came for you. You're a Republican, Jesus came for you. You're a Democrat, Jesus came for you. You like wearing masks, Jesus came for you. You think masks are stupid, Jesus came for you. No one is outside the bounds of who Jesus came to save. He comes to save those who have been oppressed by racism and even the racists who will repent. It's offensively inclusive. What kind of savior would welcome people like that? And so we resist his claims. We resist his claims to be king and we resist his claims to be savior. So they were mocking Jesus because of his claims and we do the same today and they were also mocking Jesus because of his ways, his ways. They were mocking because of his message, his claims, and they're mocking because of his ways, his method. Here's what I mean. They're asking the question, how could this guy be king? How could this guy be savior? He was born into a poor working class family with no influence. He's from Nazareth, not Jerusalem or Caesarea Martina. He's Jewish. He's not a Roman citizen. He's got no education. He's been talking about how he's going to go up to Jerusalem and he's got to go to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to save everybody. And then he rides in on a donkey, not a horse, not a chariot. He doesn't come into Jerusalem with an army. Instead, he gets arrested and beaten up and we're spitting on him and flogging him. This guy can't be the king. You can't be the king. You can't be the savior because if you were, would I be able to do this to you and this to you and this to you and this to you? So do something. We'll believe in you if you do something. Like now's your chance. Prove it. But he doesn't do anything. Hey, why don't you just come down And save yourself. You're the savior. Ooh. But you're not going to save yourself? They resist his ways. See, mockery always comes from an attitude of superiority, doesn't it? And we, just like they, can mock his ways. We do the same thing. We think that we know how a good and loving and powerful God should work. I know what would be best for me. I know what circumstances would make me happy. I know what would be best for our family. I know what's right and what's wrong. And what are we doing? We're resisting his ways. When we look at our life and we're not content with the circumstances, and we say, God, what are you doing? That is mocking his ways. We're doing the same thing. 
what a loving God we have. Wow, so loving for letting me go through this thing. What a generous and wealthy God for letting my family struggle financially like this. What a kind father who gives good and perfect gifts when my family is falling apart. Wow, God, good job. And when we live with an attitude like this, we will miss some of the greatest work that God is doing. When God intended to do his greatest work in the world, how did he come? What were his ways? Jesus' power to redeem is demonstrated most, not in his strength, but in his suffering. And this reminds us of something we learned a few months ago in Isaiah, that many times God's work is slow, not fast. It's small, not big. It's difficult, not easy. So why was Jesus mocked? because of something that's universally true of all of us. We resist his claims and we resist his ways. And because we feel superior, we mock. And what does the mocking teach us about Jesus? The mocking teaches us that Jesus has a strength and kindness that are not of this world. Jesus has a strength and a kindness that are not of this world. In a way, the mockers are right. Like, okay, Jesus, you're up there. Now's your chance, man. Like, this, this would be the way that you could prove to everybody that you really are the Savior and the King. So, Let's see it. What, what's, the, what's the grand finale here? And that's how we think. That's how most movies go. Courtney and I are really into a show called Psych. Uh, we're kind of late to the game. Or I am. She watched it a long time ago. But, you know, the end of every episode is the same. Lassie comes in or Henry comes in and saves him, you know? And that's how movies go. When the hero has got his back up against the wall... Right before he's, he's killed, right before he's arrested, right before the guy pulls the trigger, then you find out that he's got the knife hidden in his sock, or he has a trap door, or he has some special power, or somebody comes in at the last minute, or there was a plan that nobody knew about, and R2-D2 actually has the lightsaber before he's going to jump into the thing, and you know, like, there's, there's all kinds of, that's how it goes. When the hero's back is against the wall, all right, now's your chance. But not with Jesus on the cross. Why? Because Jesus is not the hero who came to escape death. He's the hero who came to beat it. And so there is a strength to him that is not of this world. There has never been a greater act of self-control than Jesus on the cross. When he could have just had a thought and killed everyone there and healed himself instantly and climbed down and said, well, takes care of that when he could have called a legion of angels down, when he could have had a one-liner that would have made them all look ridiculous, he stays silent and he suffers. That is strength. Imagine the self-control. And he was doing it to save you. See, 
if we want. If we want to get to a place where we look at his claims and rather than resist them, we surrender, we have to learn to see the wisdom of his ways. If Jesus holds on to his glory, if Jesus pulls off some trick to shame them rather than absorb the shame, if Jesus holds on to his glory, then you and I will go down. We will be humiliated. But Jesus endures the shame and the mocking so that we can be honored in the presence of God. For salvation to really be of God, the path to salvation had to be mocked by the world. Otherwise, you wouldn't know it was from God. The ways of God are always mocked by the world. And it wouldn't require you to trust God if the ways of the cross were wise in the world's eyes. And trusting God is always what leads to being saved. So if we're going to submit to his claims, if we're going to surrender to his claims, we've got to learn to see the wisdom of his ways. There is a strength and a kindness that Jesus is demonstrating here that is not of this world. So how should you respond to the mocking of Jesus? There's only one person in the story who gets it right. Jesus was crucified in the middle of two criminals, one on his right, one on his left. Jesus is the center of the show. In the other gospel account, it tells us that both criminals were mocking Jesus. So even as they're hanging in their own shame, they can be relieved of some of the shame by joining in the mockery of Jesus. So they're each looking to Jesus, mocking him as they hang there. And then something happens to one of the criminals. At something, something happens. At some point as he's on the cross, his thinking begins to change. You know what we call that? Repentance. Maybe it's him hearing Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. But something changes in him and he begins to realize there's something more to this guy in the middle. There is a strength to him that this world does not know. And there is a kindness in him that this world does not know. And so he chooses to rebuke the other criminal. And in doing so, he chooses to join in, to, to identify with Jesus and become a target for the same mocking that's being pointed at Jesus. He could have just died in peace with no dignity, but at least he's not the, the center of all the jokes at the end of his life. But there was something about the strength and the kindness he, he saw in the middle that made him go, hey, shut up. You and I are getting what we deserve but he's done nothing wrong. Do you even fear God? And then he looks at Jesus and he says, just a simple request. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I believe that you're a king. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a kingdom. 
Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I believe that you will have the power to remember me because you're a savior. And Jesus says, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. Today, you're gonna be with me in paradise. Because you chose to accept my claims and to see the wisdom of my ways. Have you done that? Have you surrendered to Jesus' claims? And have you started to see the wisdom of his ways? If we are going to be a people who follow Jesus, we are gonna need to be marked by a strength and a kindness that's not of this world, just like Jesus was. Think about some of the most basic commands of the New Testament. When we are mocked or persecuted, we do not become offended or fight back. Instead, we forgive and entrust ourselves to God. We pray for our political leaders, even when they are godless and unwise, so that we can live quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and dignity. We use our power and privilege to serve those who are weaker than us. The widows, the orphans, the immigrants. We give generously and cheerfully. We deny our worldly lusts and passions. These are all basic commands of the New Testament. And they are all things that are only possible if you have a strength and a kindness that is not of this world. That strength and that kindness is demonstrated, is personified in Jesus. And if you follow him, his spirit can empower you to to live the same way. That's my hope for you. That's my hope for us. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you that he did not despise the cross. Thank you that he endured the mocking. God, I pray that your spirit would be active now. If there are those in the room or watching online who who do not know you, would you introduce yourself? God, you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. So God, I ask that you would give grace now. I pray that there would be hearts that are humble to your claims. Help us to trust your claims. Help us to see the wisdom of your ways. Help us to be a people who are marked by a strength and kindness that are not of this world as we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. Would you stand?